Sada Shiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmada Sharya Paryantam Vande Guru Parantaram Ishwaro Guratmeti Murti Veda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadhyaptadehaya Dakshinamurtaye Namaha Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadguru Pranatoshnam Krishna, Govinda, Narayana. Okay, five kinds of knowledge. These are the, these are the vrittis you have to deal with. These are, I'm going to explain the vrittis, the thoughts. Obviously, you don't have to deal with every single thought. Well, the Vedanta works by categorizing thoughts. And if I can eliminate a category as not self, I can eliminate all the thoughts in that category. Right? If I can eliminate them. And that's what we do. We classify all the thoughts according to the type of thought that, that, that we have. And then we eliminate that type of thought and then all the specific thoughts that arise out of that fundamental thought or that basic thought well you can dismiss it so you don't have to spend your time going through picking through every single thought every second and discriminating okay. the um, mandukya upanishad um, collects all the thoughts into three thoughts waking state thoughts, the dream state thoughts, and the deep sleep thought. Because that's the totality of our experience, isn't it? If we can eliminate those three thoughts, then what? What's going to be left over? Not me, I awareness. Awareness. I'm going to be left over. It's simple. Anyway, so five kinds of thoughts are right knowledge, it's called pramana, wrong knowledge, viparaya, delusion, vikalpa, sleep, nidra. And memory, what is memory? Oh yeah, smritya. Smriti or smrityaya. Those don't seem like thoughts, do they? Huh? Oh, these, 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 huh? these are the five basic categories of thoughts. All specific thoughts fit into one of these five categories. So we're going to get rid of these categories. Understanding what they are. You'll see, because the, the definitions are all very clear. What each one of these is is very clear. It says here. So, what is right knowledge? I see the world because it exists. What, is that right knowledge? Huh? No, that's not right no. knowledge. It's not right knowledge. That's wrong knowledge. Huh? I see the world, therefore it exists, is right knowledge. Because I see it, it exists. Now, is, is that how you think of the world? Huh? 
No, <laughs> that's not how you think of the world. Huh? You, huh? you think that the world huh, creates yourself. In other words, you depend upon the world, don't you? You're generated by the, the world. The fact that, huh? the fact that you see it means that I exist. It means that I, a jiva, exist. <coughs> but no, the world exists because I exist. Can you have an object without awareness of that object? Can you have an object without knowledge of the object? Tell me, tell me something you don't know. <laughs> huh? Huh? You can't, can you? Because as soon as you tell me what it is, you know it, don't you? So, Vidya looks perplexed, no? Well, no, I was just thinking, if you don't know how to you know, split an atom or something, y yeah, you, you know you know, don't know how to do that. That's right, but, what, but that's true. But who knows how to do that? Well, some scientist. Yeah, Ishwar, science. Science knows how to do that. But, but can you have something without the knowledge of that thing? It means that all objects are made of what? Knowledge. Doesn't it? This whole thing we call the world is made out of knowledge. Only. Now you can see if it's made out of knowledge, we can deal with it. What if it's actual, what if a tree is actually a tree? What can I do about that? What if water is actually water? And air is actually air? And fire is actually fire? What, what can you do about that? Huh? You, uh, you'll, you will find yourself dependent upon it, won't you? It will be, it will be bossing you, won't it? Because a boss or a god is something that, that controls and governs or regulates you. So now, now we're all worried about uh, water. And, huh? Are we? Particularly here, well, they have to be very careful because the, you know, the whole Mediterranean area is burning up, and this place has been burning up for a long time. We we have very limited water here, all right, and we're worried about that because we depend upon water, don't we? Or huh? we what we means what? The body. <laughs> we yeah, there we means the body, but does uh, consciousness depend upon water? No, it doesn't depend upon water. It's uh, it's free of water. So so it says here. I see the world, therefore it exists. Where does where does the existence of the water come from? Then water does exist. We know that because you can't see something or experience something that doesn't exist, can you? It has to exist to, to, for you to see it, to, to experience it, doesn't it? But where then, if, if this, if, if water is not real, then where does it get its reality from? It borrows it from awareness. Now, the existence in the water is what? Is it water or is it awareness? It's awareness. Think about that. The existence in the water is not water, it's awareness. Water's getting its existence from existence itself. Now, how can anything borrow from awareness? Can awareness lend? 
Because for, for me to borrow something, there has to be a lender. If I go, if I want to go to the bank, if I want to borrow money, I have to go to a bank or somebody with money. So there has to be a lender for me to become a borrower. But can huh, can awareness lend existence to objects? No. Huh? Then, 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 then what? Huh? Ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> only the only problem in is ignorance. You see how quickly I can solve this problem of the reality of objects is by understanding that I, all problems are ignorance problems. They're not actual worldly problems. They're not karmic problems. They're not problems based upon uh, on my birth. Huh? As long as you think you're born, uh, you've got a problem. Right? I can see people in their heads or some people are thinking about this. <laughs> yeah, that's good to think about. It, right? it may take a little while to assimilate this. If you're not born, then can you have a problem? Then you don't have any karma, do you? It, is, it, is it a fact that you exist? Is it a fact that you're aware? Well, then, then, uh, then you can't have any problems Unless you think that what? Awareness right, is created or belongs to you. Awareness is you, but awareness doesn't belong to you because you are awareness. You can't own awareness or borrow anything from awareness. If, if the bank loans you money, it's not your money. It's the bank's money. You have to give it back, right? Well, how do you give it back? Well, you understand, in other words, that ignorance caused me to think that what? That this awareness, this life, okay, life, let's take life, just life. That's the most one valuable thing to you, isn't it? Did you give yourself life? No, you didn't give yourself life. Then where'd you get it? Where, where did you get it? The creator. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. Ishwara gave it to you. So insofar as you are a person, uh, you better understand who your boss is. Hmm? Who you're dependent upon. Understand? Think of it. I mean, think of the compassion that... that that comes when you contemplate on this fact. The, the, the love that comes when you realize that this valuable thing that's most valuable to you has been given freely to you without any obligation by some intelligent entity. You, we can call it a mother, father, God, if you like. That's a good symbol. Because mother, father, you know, we think they give us a body. Obviously, they don't. They, they, but they're good symbols for this intelligent entity, this present entity that's always present, that's blessing us with life. It's giving us this most valuable thing. Now, unless we can understand that, we're not going to get free. Because the, the, the gateway to the self is through what? Ishvara, through the Creator. Understanding that fact. Okay, so it says here, it borrows whatever reality it has from me, existence, shininess, consciousness. If, now, if, there's always a fine print, there's always a, a caveat, right? If the senses are not defective and the mind is clear or pure, the yogi sees the world as it is without what? Assumptions, biases, 
opinions, beliefs, judgments, and so on, memories, and so on. If what? If what? If the senses are not defective, the mind is pure, in other words, free of thought, and the yogi sees the world as it is without assumptions, biases, and judgments. There's the power of yoga. Now you're dealing with what is, not with what? A belief or opinion or huh, a judgment or whatever. Normally when something happens, we, uh, that happening triggers a vasana, a bias, a, a, a presumption, an assumption, huh? a belief or an opinion, and we immediately find ourselves, what, caught up in some kind of relationship with the, the thought, with the object. The thoughts are the objects. The thoughts and the feelings are the objects. They're known to you. If we're highly unevolved, we think those thoughts are coming from outside. A yogi is a, what, what is a yogi? What, what's required to practice yoga? The idea that I'm responsible for what I think and feel. That the world's not responsible for what I think and feel. That I'm responsible for what I think and feel. So it says here. Now, what's the next? Next is called pramana. Pramana means inference. Okay? So, inference is reasoning based upon perception. To, to make an inference, you need to have a perception. What's, what's the most obvious example? Smoke and fire. Hmm. Smoke and fire. If there's a fire on the other side of the mountain, or, that, or this side here, on that side, that ridge, if there's smoke coming up, Need I go over there and drive over there to look and see if there's a fire? <clears throat> no. I don't need to operate direct perception, do I? All I have to do is operate inference. Inference tells me that there's an inviolable connection between what? Smoke and fire. So wherever you see smoke, there's fire, you needn't investigate it personally. The fire department can do that if they want to. Somebody else can go there and have, look at it if they... You know, we, I, I started a fire here last year. I, I didn't, Ishwar did, but <laughs> I took responsibility for it. And, and uh, <laughs> the guy was so funny. I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, I, I could have lied because there was no evidence that I started that fire. But I did, and I didn't start it, actually. But I took responsibility. I didn't start it because I put out coals in the morning when it was quiet, and I didn't realize, and then the wind came up like four or five hours later and fanned the coals, and it started a fire. And so I could have easily lied, and, and I could have been telling the truth because I really didn't start it. I could have been looking at it from the self's point of view and said, I didn't really start it. It's where I started I should have said that. But I, I understood that that argument wouldn't work here. <laughs> so I just said, no, I started it. And the man was so impressed with the fact that I was honest and owned up to that thing that he didn't write up a report and it didn't cost me anything. The fire department came and they put out the fire and everything like that. In, inference is based upon what? Because I, I saw two men coming up out of the canyon before. And I could have said, I, I saw two men coming up, and I believe they were smoking. <laughs> so uh, so that maybe they threw out the cigarette, they tossed their cigarette butt, and then it started a fire. That often happens. So I could have lied there, but I just said, uh, no. So, so... In, uh, any inference, is, has, there has to be a basis to infer. Now, the fact that I see an object, 
whatever it is, a material object, an emotional object, or a thought object. These are just different categories of objects, or classes of objects. Implies what? We can't have an effect without a cause. That's right. So what would be the cause of the object? Of all objects. Awareness. Wouldn't it? Huh? What else could it be? There's no other... Huh? Now that means what? I can... Uh, and, and inference is a valid means of knowledge. It's not specious. Uh, think, think of think of the of the of this sending the rocket ships out to to view these other planets. You know they send a now. Is that based upon direct perception or is that based upon inference? inference. Totally inference, isn't it? Because when I shoot the rocket, the the planet that I want is over in that sky there. But you never shoot the rocket at the place where the planet, where you see the planet, where you know the planet is. So I, you shoot it, huh? Where it will be in five years. <laughs> you can calculate where the planet will be in five years, and you can aim the rocket for that place, and then the rocket will intercept the gravitational field of that planet and start to go around the planet. But that's all done on the basis of inference. You know, speed of light, the speed of this, all these various factors are calculated in to gain that knowledge. And that's definitely valid means of knowledge. Now, what would be the problem with the self, with uh, direct perception or inference for the self? Can't it. Yeah, you can't objectify it. <laughs> if you uh, if you can't objectify it, then you can't make an inference, can you? You can't perceive it, and you can't. Why can't you perceive the self? Because you are the self. <laughs> you can't perceive it because you are it. But then, could you think of like, well, if the mind's a mirror, then everything I'm seeing in the mind is just a reflection of me, anyway? Well, yes, you know, that's inference. Yeah, if you take the mind as a mirror, then you can infer uh, the existence of awareness, or you can just d directly understand that uh, without, which is inference also, that without awareness, without knowledge. There's one intermediate step. One is knowledge and then awareness. Because, uh, so I, I can't have knowledge of an object without awareness, can I? Knowledge doesn't exist without awareness. I'm aware I can't have knowledge. And I can't be aware unless I am awareness, can I? Can't be aware unless I am awareness. So, uh, so the next stage is what I am awareness because I know I'm awareness um, because an object is known to me. Uh, is known to me. Objects are known to me because I am awareness. The correct way to say it. So, says where there are objects, there is a knower. That's the logic. Which is what? Consciousness or awareness? The self. Because the self cannot be objectified, knowledge of it is not available for the senses. Just as what? The eyes, what? The eyes, can your eyes see themselves? So what do I need to see my eyes? A mirror. Huh? Yeah, I need something to reflect it. So how am I going to see the self then? Because that leads to the next topic that he talks about. It's called uh, Aptavakya, or uh, scriptural knowledge. What does the scripture do? It's a word mirror. The, uh, that knowledge is reflected in, uh, 
in the scripture. And I can see myself there. And that's all I need. I don't, huh? I don't need to turn around and look, because uh, I, I often use the example of driving an automobile. Now, to drive an automobile, you need knowledge of what's in front of you, which you can perceive, mm -hmm. and you need knowledge of what's behind you, don't you? If you didn't need knowledge of what was behind you, you wouldn't have a rear view mirror, would you? You have rear view mirrors in a car because what? you need knowledge of behind you. But you don't have to directly look around every every second when you're driving. Well, the car's here and looking in. Otherwise, you never see anybody driving down the freeway like that, do you? <laughs> what do they What do they do? They just glance in the mirror, huh? And they know what's behind them. Or in India, maybe they don't use the mirror, they, they have horns. <laughs> huh? They use sounds. But the sound, you can tell by the intensity of the sound, how close that object is to you. And how big it is. And how big it is, and so, so how big it is, and, and what you should do. If you can, that's inferential, inferential knowledge. So it says, yeah. it says so... So you need a means of knowledge, and what is it? Well, it's Vedanta. Vedanta scriptures are the proven, impersonal testimony of competent, unconcerned witnesses. That's called Aptavakya. These are people who just witnessed something. They're not, huh? They didn't generate something from their own mind. They just saw something. And enough of them saw the same thing that, huh, that what, it becomes what, independent of the one who sees it. Makes sense? Says, yeah. Sages that were revealed thousands of years ago. They are perennial wisdom, not a philosophy. Perennial wisdom means what? They're always good. Under every time, place, and circumstance, that knowledge is always good. Right? And they are pretty wisdom, not a philosophy, which is a contention of an individual or group. It doesn't come from them. Neither a religion, neither a religion nor mysticism, comma, Vedanta is a word mirror that reveals a self which can be known by a qualified person at any time and place. And what would a qualified person be? A person whose uh, mind is clear, right? who's done the yoga, whose mind is clear and whose attention is what directed toward the self in the form of these words. That's why listening is the most important topic. The, the subsequent stages, all the problems that come from the evaluation stage from the reflection stage and the assimilation stage are based upon faulty listening. It always goes back to I wasn't listening clearly when I get stuck. You think you think you heard it and you're sure you heard it and you get all fine you think I'm I know who I am and so forth and so on and I understand what the world is and all of, you know I understand the body and the mind. I've been taught all this stuff. But there's something you didn't hear carefully or clearly, uh, and later on that's going to come back and bite you. Huh? Yeah, you guys all know this. <laughs> huh? I never get tired of listening to it. I mean, I, I, that's why I teach it. It's just so cool. It just refreshes the Doors of perception. You don't have to take a, a psychedelic drug or some kind of drug to cleanse the doors of perception. You just have to listen clearly. Focus your mind, concentrate your mind on what's happening present, and this teaching will refresh your, clean, clean your, your mind. This is the fastest form of purification. Kama Yoga takes a little bit of time. I've got to 
go through this whole process and think about things and think things through and so forth and so on. Here, no, not necessarily. I just listen to the teachings. Says here. Now, what's uh, so that's right knowledge and scriptural knowledge. Okay, what is erroneous knowledge, viparaya? Uh, what would be a good example of that? Snake and a rope. That's our, our, our most famous example. We don't need to go uh, dream up another example because uh, it's not about the example, it's about the truth that's contained in that example. Erroneous knowledge is perceiving one object uh, as if it were something else. To see one thing as if it's something else. Mistaking a rope for a snow, snake in twilight, for instance. And we just discussed that, was it last night we discussed that? Yes, we did. The twilight zone. The twilight zone is where knowledge and ignorance are mixed up. And it's possible to what? Confuse knowledge and ignorance. Uh, yes, we talked that about last night. I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I ordered the, this is the, the new book, but it's stuck in customs, and I had copies or, made for you guys. I was going to hand them out with the proper print. This is way too tiny. You can barely read it. I mean, take a, I don't know what it takes to read this sort of thing. That's why I'm going like this. <laughs> And it's stuck in customs for the last four months, and nobody knows oh, where it is. And oh. Kate and I spent basically a whole day, or huge hours, filling out forms and so forth. That wasn't even the, the, the shipment. It came through later, and then that same problem. And I answered all the questions and told them this and that and the other thing, and, and it and doesn't come. 500 euros down the tube. And no, and you poor people, you have to suffer without a text. You have to listen. <laughs> so I feel obligated to teach you, since you can't read it. So let's see here. Yeah, you know this. I won't even tell. I won't even read it. Again. Okay, now. <clears throat> the subjective reality. Erroneous knowledge is based on hearing of words resulting in thoughts that do not correspond to reality. There's a I, I'm probably I'm probably gonna get get myself in trouble here. But this, this is not based upon my knowledge of anybody here, but there's a lady that we know who lives here in this area. And she, she believes that, that the rich people are, are going to kill off all the poor people. So she's building a, you know, underground bunker and all that sort of stuff to protect her from it. And the rich people are trying to get rid of the poor people. And so this is a big survival thing. So she's going to survive and she's going to hire people to protect her when, when, when the, the whole world collapses. But she's she's rich, rich, she's she must be rich. rich. Huh? Has <laughs> then wouldn't the, the poorest rich people become the poor people? And then they'd have to well, the, well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the problem is the rich people want a lot of poor people. Huh? Yeah. The rich people don't want less poor people. They need us. The rich people, yeah. they, they, huh? They need, it. They need us. Yeah. Huh? Huh? Because the more poor people there are, the cheaper labor is. So the more profit is available to them. The less, <laughs> this is a zero sum business. Huh? The, the less people there are, the more expensive it's going to be to hire a person to protect you, and to feed you, and doing all this sort of thing. Huh? And, and, and that is definitely going to like, Im impede your bottom line, assuming that you're interested in, in wealth. Isn't it? Plus, there's another factor. Huh? 
you become dependent on the one who's protecting you, but he or she's dependent upon what? He or she wants to live a lot more, uh, you know, for his or herself, not for your sake. So when, when push comes to shove, this person that you're depending upon to protect you is going to finish you off. So the whole, the whole construct, the whole mental construct, huh, is based upon what? Non-examination of what? Of the facts. I, I don't want to know the facts. Because if I know the facts, I won't what? I won't be able to what? Indulge in this fantasy. <coughs> and you see now, this is a subjective reality, is you have a whole bunch of people, about 25 or 30% of the population, who doesn't trust anybody or anything except themselves. They think they're really smart because they don't trust science and they don't trust God and they don't trust this and they don't trust that and so forth and so on. They're looking after themselves. Well, that's, that's what he calls, that's what Vedanta calls erroneous knowledge. It's not that that person's not the self, it's just the what? They're invested right, in uh, distrust. But to function here, I've got to trust, don't I? This is what we're saying. This is what trusting God, trusting Ishwara, uh, is the only way you're going to get up to here. Isn't it? The only way you're going to realize this is if you're able to trust Ishwara. Otherwise, you're just going to keep creating yourself as what? As a, a suspicious, doubtful entity. So Vedanta removes all doubts about your uh, about what? About Jiva, Jagat, and Ishwara. It removes all the doubts about the nature of this, the nature of this, and the nature of the world itself. Because I want to be doubt-free. I don't want to be, uh, be responsible for the fear. Because fear is not something you decide upon, is it? You don't choose to be fearful. And if you do, then you have, then you're what? Then you're actually ca causing yourself an extra problem. But you don't. Nobody chooses to be fearful. Because fear, no, nobody chooses to want either. Why? Because both fear and desire are painful. They're contrary to why nature is bliss. See how Vedanta fits in here? Those are thoughts that are contrary to my nature, which is bliss. And it's because of what? Because I love, uh, because my nature is bliss, that I love myself so much. So now he's talking about the subjective reality. Yeah. And what happened in Vedanta, I was really quite surprised. Uh, not really, but I was surprised at how many Vedanta people simply do not want to like include their fears and their desires in the equation. They, they wall those off. They say, well, this isn't a valid means of inquiry. Huh? They, 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 uh, well, when I was in California, I had a little ashram, and it was during the gay Mecca, and gay people used to come to the to the satsang and to the, hear the teaching and the, and the meditation, and we fed people, and it was very nice, and and uh, and when I when I wanted to have a discussion with them about gayness, about the identity of gayness. 95% of them wouldn't come back because because uh, that identity was uh, not subject to what? Question. Not subject to inquiry. Right? Only There were only three or four that, that were not actually understood what we were talking about. And one of them became a, good, a really good Vedanta teacher and went to try to teach Vedanta to the gay community there at the time. Yeah. So, so the idea here is that, you know, that, that wrong knowledge becomes hard and fast knowledge for me. 
and, and it's easy to think that what I believe and think and feel is, is right knowledge. And, and we gotta, you got to get it very clear that it very, possi very possibly isn't. It may be and it may not be. We just need to uh, have a way to look at it in such a way that we can determine whether or not what I believe and think and feel is actually in harmony with the nature of reality or not. That's all. So insofar as it's not in harmony with the nature of reality, I'm going to suffer. Whether I think I'm protecting myself or not, it doesn't matter. So let me sit here. <clears throat> and well, now it says, I'll read you this, I, I like this. One jumps to a conclusion without knowing one is jumping to a conclusion. <laughs> it says here, because the unconscious mind's heuristic principle, what is the heuristic principle? Simplification. Ishwar has to simplify everything for this jiva. Because this jiva has only limited comprehension, limited knowledge. Ishwar has got all knowledge of everything. And jiva has limited knowledge. Can perceive and can infer and can know certain things, but only limited amount of knowledge. At the same time, we're swimming in an ocean of what? Of knowledge. This ocean of knowledge is what? Ishwara. This, our little mind, is a subset of Ishwara's mind. So all the information that's available to, uh, to all creatures everywhere and to all the processes that are operating inert or material properties or, or, or processes that are operating here are what? Are, are, are affecting us all the time. Are, uh, are, are bombarding our consciousness all the time. And if we had to, if we don't have the capacity to what to deal with them. So Ishwara, out of compassion, he what? He simplifies it. He simplifies our experience. Now when you simplify your experience, what do you do? You get a, an approximation of reality, you don't get reality. You're not actually seeing what's happening there, you're seeing a simplified form hmm, that, that is, makes it comprehensible to your mind because your mind is an only handle simple concepts, simple ideas. I want this, I don't want that. I like this, I don't like that. These are the basic concepts. And I want to be free. That, that's a basic concept that's operating all the time too. And so, so he says here. So, so what is it? The, the, the mind's heuristic principle generates a simplified version of creation's incredible complexity, allowing the individual, individual to seemingly make rational choices. Hmm? Now, this lady I was, that we met here, she's a lovely lady. We, don't, we never talk about it, we don't expose that. She, you know, she realized that we didn't think like she did, and we realized we didn't think like she did. So we both, there was a conscious point where we both decided not to <laughs> tweak each other's, because huh? because she's a lovely person and you can see the, the love and the care and the, you see the awareness there and she can see the life and the awareness in us. So so there's plenty of basis for a, for a, a relationship quite apart from the difference that we have of opinions that we have, the views that we have. So, so... It's a nice relationship. It's fine. Right? But anyway, so it says here. Uh, yeah, allowing the individual to seemingly make rational choices or at least formulate reasonable doubts. <laughs> I have this doubting function. Remember when we talked about how, how this, in the Karma Yoga talk, a karma yoga is meant to deal with this process of stimulus and response, and how the mind, a doubt is built into the mind. Why, why would Ishwara build doubt into your mind? 
nothing's what it seems. Yeah. Because nothing's what it seems. So Ishwara wants you to question. <laughs> That's why Ishwara produces a doubt. Now, if, if you're too anxious about the results of an action, you'll dismiss that doubt, huh? and you'll just take what? You'll just operate on the basis of your conditioning, which, which won't solve the problem. Okay? You'll just bypass this doubt. But there should be a doubt with every, huh? That, that doubt should be honored. Because Ishwar is there, is, is, is trying to protect you from, from the fact that what? That everything you see is not actually real. It looks like it's real, all right. It definitely, if it, you know, we think of it smells and tastes and touches and so forth, we think that it's real. That's our definition of reality, is what you can smell, taste, touch, and feel, isn't it? But that, those things that you can smell, taste, touch, and feel are what? They're cooked up by ignorance. They're not real. They're appearances. And Ishwar is saying, now stop and think about this. Huh? Then... At that point, what can you do? You have an option of what? Of listening to the scripture rather than listening to your vasanas. If you listen to your vasanas, huh, then you're just going to keep going round and round. If you listen to the scripture, you're going to be provided with a, a, a cognitive, a different way of looking at things. You're going to be introduced to what? To your true, your true self, i.e., to the perspective that solves all the problems. The one, the, one, the one piece of knowledge that solves all problems is what separates me from my experience. Because experience is unreliable. And there's nothing I want more than security. And, and the only security is in that knowledge. Uh, this is where the security lies. It doesn't lie in what? in any experience. Person, people, things, and all that sort of thing. You can't, you can't count on this because it's never the same from one moment to the next. So, you see the problem. This is a real subtle problem. So, however, unbeknownst to the ego, unconsciousness biases cause the ego to interpret words incorrectly. Uh, I, I, if you marry somebody from a different culture, I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> this is, this is, Sundri is a South African. She was, she was born in Tanzania. And she lived in South Africa. And I'm uh, bo born in, in Montana and raised in Idaho. Now, can you imagine that, that the way we use words is going to be the same? Huh? That a word, huh? We, we were talking about this, there's underneath that table there, there's a chest, C-H-E-S-T. But what's the word in, in South Africa, chest? Christ? Kissed. 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 So she's talking about the kissed. And I'm thinking, kissing. <laughs> and she's thinking the chest. And I'm saying, I don't understand what she's talking about. So we're going on back and forth, you know, and, and I'm getting irritated and she's getting irritated because what? Because I don't understand what kissed is. I think kissed is kissing. And, 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 and she doesn't understand that, that I'm saying chess. The, the only problem was what? Simply different words. This is why we, 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 we set up a whole new language for you. If you learn, if you learn this language, huh? Then we can. Then we're all on the same page. 
<laughs> so when I say subject, and I, you know what that means. When I say object, you know what that means. Huh? And so forth and so on. There's just a certain, certain basic simple terminology that allows us to what be on the same page and communicate this science of reality. This science, this science of consciousness, the science of existence, whatever you want to call it. Now, because of my experience, what do I do? I, uh, now that's fine if I'm the only person that exists in the world, if, if I don't need anybody else, isn't it? It's fine to believe what you believe. You can, you, you can, huh, you can think anything you want. If, if you live alone and, and you don't have to interact with anybody else, but as soon as you have to interact with somebody else, immediately the problem of words comes up, doesn't it? Because no two people are born at the same time in the same place. Impossible. Every single person is born at a different time, in a different place, and has a different background, and therefore what? The words that uh, they learn are appropriate to their karma, to their background, to their past. And they're not wrong. Their, their words are good. But the words are not helpful when they're dealing with somebody with a different back. And, and since we're social animals, we have no choice but to interact with people because everything that we value comes from other people, doesn't it? Doesn't everything that you value come from somewhat, somebody else? <laughs> Tell me one thing that you create. Yourself. Yeah, the answer is nothing. Every single thing is given to you uh, through other people by Ishwara. We call that Ishwara the factor. So I better have I better have a language that allows me to understand what you're saying and, and you understand what I'm saying, and we can build a relationship together because life is relationships isn't it that's all this is here is a, is a bunch of relations 24 7 relationships every single thought is a, is a related to a relationship is a relationship with some object some other person so so i need to I need to like understand this terminology because that's going to set me free. That's why we we at least tell the beginning people start with tatva bodh because there the terminology is laid out in a very simple, straightforward way. And that that terminology is, is useful when we get to the very last teachings, the Upanishads, and we start teaching them because because uh, without that knowledge of the basic terminology. The Upanishads are not going to make any sense. They were just revelations. They're not explained. So the, the sages that came created this great word mirror called Vedanta to help us understand the original vision. There's a beautiful, beautiful kind. And, and who did that? Huh? The, the one that creates this uh, uh, creates this mess also creates the solution. Huh? How, how beautiful is that? Creates the problem and gives you the solution. So there always is a solution. In the case of Jnana Yoga, it's what? Just understanding that what? That the one that knows the problem is free of the problem, never becomes a problem. And that if there is a problem, I'm identifying with an object, and that I can't identify with an object because the objects are not actually there. They're only produced by imagination, i.e., they're only beliefs and opinions that are generated by imagination. Imagination means Maya. I'm imagining a problem, whatever it is. And this applies to the tiniest, most simple thing and the big issues of of the world, the big world, the issues that we face every day. When life presents an idea or situation that doesn't conform to the ego's likes and dislikes, 
the unconscious mind presents alternative facts. Hmm? Those facts, huh, they, they contradict what I want to believe and think and feel. So what do I do? I generate an alternative reality. You're free to do that. There's no law against it. You can certainly generate alternative facts. But try to live in this world huh, with people whose facts don't agree with your facts. <laughs> you see the conflict. You see the source of the conflict here? It's, it's not about any particular belief. It's about what? This fantasy that comes from what? From not knowing what reality is. All these, these projections, these beliefs and opinions, these fantasies that we cook up in our head. I said here, <clears throat> the lazy or tomasic part of the mind prefers what? Prefers memes, slogans, formulas, and beliefs. Why? Because they don't require any thinking. There's a part of us that's really lazy. If you look at nature, you know, I was a, a fisherman. I grew up in the mountains in Montana on a river, and it was a, a blue ribbon trout stream. It was, you know, and I learned to fish from very early on. My uncle was one of the great, most famous sportsmen in Montana back in the day. And I learned one thing, one very simple thing about fish, they're lazy as hell. <laughs> huh? The young ones are stupid. You can catch them easily, because they'll chase anything. But, but the, the ones that have survived have learned what, they don't move much. They just sit at the bottom like this and wait, and they see the food coming and then they'll go, move over just a bit and go. <laughs> and then they go back to what they were before. The little ones will run all over the river after these weird flies and these weird lures and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but, uh, but the big ones, the ones who survive, who understand what it is, they operate on the heuristic principle. They're lazy. They just do the bare minimum. And that's us. We just want an easy life. We want to do the bare minimum. Isn't it? Uh, you don't want to do one more thing than you need to do. Huh? Big problem. Big problem, huh? So what does it do? Because this mental effort, you know, it, it is, thinking takes a lot of energy. But I've got a, a mind to think. That Ishwar has given me a, a, an instrument that does the thinking. This thing is, this thing is built to think. And I should use that to solve this existential problem. Normally, what I use it for is just manipulating, you know, events in, in, in the Maya world. I, tr I try to figure out all the factors in the field and, and get the edge here. So I'm constantly busy just manipulating stuff that's constantly changing. But here we're saying, well, why not use that power to think your way out of this pickle, out of this, huh? But when you say I, are you, it's about uh, I as an individual or I? It's I as the self thinking it's an individual. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thinking as an individual. Thinking okay. it's an okay. individual. Yeah. There's only one I, <laughs> but the I, the I is subject to ignorance, huh? And so it can think that it's an individual that's making choices. So, if you're saying that Israel gave us an intellect to think, it is in the, well, it is myself thinking I'm an individual with the possibility to think. That's right. I, that's right. If the problem is ignorance, I'm going to have to get knowledge to get out of it, and I can't get knowledge unless I think, can I? Mm -hmm. this, is, this, all this logic is, is producing knowledge. Then you follow the logic here, you get knowledge. That, huh? And that knowledge takes away the ignorance. 
So, uh, so, so the, the, the problem's in my hands and the solution is also in my hands. But there's an effort of, of the individual. It is an effort, but I'm lazy. I want it easy. And this is why it's very so difficult in the modern times, because we're in a cycle in the world, in the evolution of the world, we're in a cycle where what? Where we've solved the, the, the security issue, the, the, the money issue. Now, not everybody has, but in general. And our whole, our whole focus is on what? Pleasure. Entertainment, pleasure. I don't want to have to think. I want to enjoy. I want to have a good time. I don't want to put any effort out. Huh? This is why the, 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 in, the, in the teaching, the, the desire for pleasure, it's called uh, kama, it succeeds the desire for security, artha. They're all logically arranged according to the way in which creation and Ishwar created the whole universe. So those, those motivations that, uh, that, that are, now we're motivated what? We're not motivated for security. How, how many people are actually starving? Well, there are people starving, but in our societies, no. I was just reading now in California how, how the, the California government had to give back $230 million dollars uh, money that was that was for poor people to get how give them vouchers for houses. In other words, they're going to pay the rent for you know with two hundred thirty million dollars. That'll pay a lot of rent for a lot of people <clears throat> for a long time. The, uh, which means what the the society is capable of looking after everybody. They've got this idea of what a living wage or whatever it is where everybody just gets so much for the, for the basics, and they either work or not work, it doesn't matter, but they have enough to survive, they're taken care of. Well, what are you going to do if you're taken care of? If you don't have to worry about paying the rent? What, huh? Yeah. That's your entertainment. Sports, pornography, etc. music, travel. You know the travel thing. Look at it now. How how what a mess video is telling about. Oh my God! You you want to hear a travel story? I I thought I had a really uh, a travel story that would cause you to all feel really sympathetic, but it's nothing compared to videos. I I, I decided to not tell my my because <laughs> her problem is way worse. Uh, and you decided pretty much that travel was like, huh? Not worth it. Yeah, not worth it. It's just a pent up desire to uh, to get away from the routines of everyday life. But if your mind is fresh at every moment, every routine you do is what fresh. There's always you're something learning every second, and everything is exciting and interesting. And and as it says in the Bhakti Sutra, the love just grows and grows and grows. Hmm. The pleasure, the bliss, the love, the, the uh, just grows and grows and grows. You don't have to like run off to some place to what to to get relief from a boring situation. No situation is boring. It's boring if I'm boring. But if I'm not boring, is a situation boring? No, a situation is not. If I'm if I'm interesting and exciting and turned on about myself, then every situation is what interesting and exciting, and uh, and beneficial to me. It's giving me great pleasure. So the self is your greatest security, and the self is the biggest pleasure. And if you're after virtue or recognition, again, the self solves all those problems knowing that I'm the self, so it makes me the most famous thing in the world. So I don't need recognition. Everybody recognizes me, because uh, they see themselves in me. And I don't need to, be, to, to do anything to prove that I'm good, because I am goodness itself. I'm the source of the goodness that you see. So, so I, I don't sit around virtue signaling 
all day long to prove to myself or to others that I'm a virtuous, good person. I am the goodness. And the I am is the goodness. Put it that way. <clears throat> so, so, so the lazy part of the mind prefers memes, slogans, formulas, and beliefs because they preclude mental effort. Preclude means they don't require any mental effort. Restraint st stabilizes the outflowing chitta and produces sattva. Restraint, holding back, he says here. This is one of the principles. We're going to talk about these principles of yoga. Uh, out and produces sattva, which presents an uh, opportunity for objective investigation. When your mind is sattvic, then you can consider a thing in its opposite clearly. If your mind is not sattvic, there's going to be a bias. And that bias is going to keep you from looking at things clearly and objectively. That's all we're asking. We're not asking you to believe this or do this or do that. We're just asking you to be objective and look at it. Because uh, common sense will teach you what the right course of action is. What, what, how to respond, common sense will show you. You don't need to have a formula for it. The logic, common sense is just logic, the logic of existence will teach you what needs to be done. And you will do what needs to be done. And enjoy it. Whether, whether it, it contradicts your likes and dislikes or not, it doesn't matter. Because, because I enjoy doing what's right. Why? Because my nature is right. Because I am Dharma. So to me, the most important thing is to what? To maintain the Dharma. Not just for myself, but as a, for the world. Both yoga and Vedanta generate sattva. What is it? Clarity of perceptions and thoughts. So, what? That's it? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. It's seven o'clock. We had our we had our two sessions. We had our hour half an hour break, and we're all peaceful and happy, and we will proceed tomorrow morning at 10 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Have your, Enjoy yourself, have a good dinner, whatever it is, and we'll continue with the Vedanta teaching tomorrow. Huh? <laughs>